I would like to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of John. John chapter 1, verse 14. And we read the, the word in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You may be seated. So it's no surprise that living here in America, um, you can tell just by driving around in the streets that it's the Christmas season. You see the lights, you see all the shopping centers packed, the stores are packed, traffic is horrible. So it's easy to tell just by looking around that we are in the Christmas season. And most of you, during your, at your jobs, you might celebrate or you might get to celebrate seven holidays where you actually get some time paid off. If you have one of those jobs where you get those good benefits, right? You get seven holidays. Um, you expect New Year's Day to be off, Martin Luther King Day, uh, Memorial Day, Independence Day, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, and then Christmas. Um, but Christmas is by far the most celebrated holiday and it's celebrated in over 160 countries. Over 2 billion people celebrate Christmas. Now, that sounds amazing, outstanding. It sounds, wow, that 2 billion people celebrating Christmas. But unfortunately, only 9 out of 10, nine out of 10 people celebrate Christmas um, as a cultural holiday not a spiritual holiday. Nine out of 10 people. So that means one third of them celebrate it as a cultural holiday. That's not so good. I think that a lot of us, we've lost sight or we really don't understand why we celebrate Christmas. If I were to ask you today, why do you celebrate Christmas? Would you be able to give me an explanation? When I tell, ask you, if, how, why do we celebrate New Year's? Why do you get that day off? It's the beginning of the year. Everybody gets that day off. Why do we celebrate Martin Luther King Day? It's the, we celebrate Martin Luther King for what he did for civil rights. We celebrate Memorial Day because of all those that died in the military. We celebrate Independence Day because that's when we uh, sign the Declaration of Independence. We celebrate Labor Day to value the work of workers here in America. And we celebrate Thanksgiving to give God thanks for everything. But why do we celebrate? Why do we celebrate Christmas? And I know everybody's default answer is we celebrate the birth of Jesus. But if you really understand Christmas, that is not the primary reason that we celebrate Christmas. There are a lot of people that have birthdays that we don't celebrate. Christmas is the birthday of Jesus, which is the most celebrated birthday in the history of the world. But Christmas, unlike all the other holidays that we celebrate, is more than a holiday. It's not just another holiday. It's not just another day off. It's not just another day to spend with your family. It's not just a holiday. It is a holy day. Christmas is a holy day. In fact, it is the holiest of all days. The real reason why we celebrate the birth of this baby is because of who this baby was at his birth. One of my all-time favorite uh, Christmas carols is Hark the Herald Angel Sings. And there's a line in it. It says, veiled in flesh, the Godhead, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Every other baby born in history was a human being in nature. 
Christianity, we as believers, we say that that baby boy in Bethlehem had two natures. A human nature and a divine nature. He was a human baby, but he was also heaven's baby. He was the son of Mary, but he was also the son of God. You see, Christmas is not just a day that we celebrate. It is not even just a date that we commemorate. Christmas is about a deity that we coronate, that we worship. You know, there are a lot of things that are hard to believe about Jesus, and I get it. I mean, born from a virgin, he lived a perfect life. Nobody lives a perfect life. He did. That he died on a cross, that he came back from the dead, that doesn't happen. But if Jesus Christ was God, everything else is a piece of cake. This is a story that not even Hollywood can fathom. This is a real stumbling block in Christianity. Not the cradle, not where he was born, not the cross, not the empty tomb. But when you say that Jesus Christ was God in flesh, when you declare that Jesus Christ was God in flesh. The Jews check out, Muslims check out, Unitarians check out, Jehovah Witness check out, Buddhists check out, Hindus check out. They don't even want to touch it. Everybody wants to pay a compliment to Jesus. Oh, he was a prophet. He was different. He, but he wasn't divine. He was a great man, but he wasn't God. We as Christians, we celebrate Christmas because it was God. It was God that came in the form of flesh. Unless the gospel writers were liars, unless the disciples who died for him, who gave their lives for, the, for him, unless they were all hallucinating, if it was all fabricated, then let me tell you, it was the greatest act in history. But those eyewitnesses in one majestic sentence tells us how truly to respond to this baby born in Bethlehem. John just told us, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We celebrate Christmas as a holy day. And we worship the greatness of God. If you're celebrating Christmas by putting up a tree, putting up decorations in your house, spending all sorts of money that you don't have, jacking up your credit cards to buy Christmas gifts for everyone, but you are not taking time to worship the greatness of God, you've missed what Christmas is all about. Christmas is about worshiping the greatness of God. The word that John tells us that is God became a human being. And that is what Christians means when they speak of incarnation. He was incarnated. The word literally means the infleshing. John is not saying that the word merely clothed himself in a human costume or that he pretended to be a human being. John's language in this passage is very precise. God, without ceasing to be God, became flesh. God, without ceasing to be God, became a human being. The God who created the world, the God who created humanity, came into the world that he created as a human being. He became one of us. He became one with us. He became one to us. He became one for us. And John makes it plain. You cannot understand Christianity until you believe that the word became flesh. You cannot be a Christian if you do not believe the word became flesh. Most religions have no problem with a God who created the world. They don't have a problem with a God that sits up in heaven in his throne. They don't have a problem that makes the stars shine and twinkle and our planet, these planets twirl, spin. 
They don't have a problem with that. What they do have a problem is how Christmas says that God is now human. Christmas is not how high God can go, but how low God has come. Becoming a human being simply doesn't belong to the definition of a God. He is God Almighty. He is God all powerful. He is holy, holy, holy. He is the God of the impossible. But he is the God that is now human. No other religion will ever, ever confess that their God is human. But you can't explain what Jesus did until you realize who Jesus was. God can never stop being God. Jesus, the Son of God, has always been God. There never was a time that he was not God. There was a time he was not human, but he has always been God. Understand this, Jesus was not a humanized God or deified man. He was a true God man. He wasn't half God and half man. He was all God and all man. You see, you can take Jesus out of heaven, but you can't take heaven out of Jesus. You can't take God out of the man, and you can't take the man out of God. The most basic, important, distinctive teaching, teaching of Christianity is not that Jesus was born. It's not that Jesus lived. It's not that Jesus died. Not even that he came back from the dead. It's that he was God. Do you know why God did this? Do you know why God did this? Because God wants us to know him intimately. God wants us to know him personally. God wants us to know him completely, fully, and spiritually. How can a sinful human know a perfect spirit? How can a perfect God get a sinful person like you and me into heaven? This is what he did. He brought heaven to us. Jesus came not just to tell us what God was like. He came to show us what God was like. If you ever want to know what God would be teaching right now, just listen to what Jesus said. If you ever wonder how God would act, look at how Jesus act. Jesus is God. God walked out of the door of heaven and through the door of Bethlehem. And this world has never been the same. Do you know why? Because the baby that was born was not just God and man. He wasn't just God in man. He was the one, the only God man. That is why you don't celebrate Christmas as a holiday. You celebrate Christmas as a holy day. And we have to worship the greatness of God. We celebrate Christmas as a holy day when we witness the glory of God. John continues to say in that verse, verse, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son. That word seen, it doesn't mean just uh, to be able to look at. It actually means to stare at with amazement. John was his disciple, spent three years with Jesus. He was an actual eyewitness and John says, I saw the glory of God in his works. I saw the glory of God in his words. He was an eyewitness. He was a testament of what God's glory was like. Every moment with Jesus was amazing. He would see a man who would get thirsty and need water. And then he would see a God who could walk on water. 
He would see a man who got hungry and needed bread. And then you would see a God that would feed the multitude. He saw a man who died on the cross. Oh, but he saw a God who rose again. Yes. Let me be honest. Let's all be honest. It just doesn't seem logical, does it? Think about it. If Jesus was God, he was God. If he was man, he was a man. If he is God, he can't be a man. And if he's a man, he can't be a God. That's logical, right? Are you guys following me? And that's what people say all the time. But if he's God, how did he become a man? And if he's a man, how come he can still be God? But let me tell you how I actually like the fact that that is mind-boggling. I actually like that it's not logical. I actually like that I don't really have an answer for it because... If I could truly understand, if you could truly understand everything there is to understand about our God, then he wouldn't be much of a God, would he? So the fact that this word is his word, and it's his absolute, inerrant truth, tells me that he was God and flesh. That just shows me how amazing God is, and I'm not even going to begin to try to understand how that even happens. I'm going to worship, and I'm going to see his glory. I want to witness his glory. I don't know. I can't see the Holy Spirit. Oh, but I can testify that the Holy Spirit is real. I don't see Jesus. I don't see God with my physical eyes, but no one here can stop me from believing that he exists. He has been too good to me. He has been there when I thought I was not going to make it. He has lifted me when I thought I was going to die. He has healed me when I thought I was sick in the hospital and about to, to die. I don't know how he did it. I can't explain how he did it. Oh, but I've seen his glory. And this Christmas season, are you witnessing God's glory? Or are you so wrapped up and stressed out about what you're going to get for Christmas, what you're going to give? Maybe you couldn't afford to give somebody you love what they truly wanted and you had to settle for a, a less of a gift. Maybe you're down and depressed because during the holiday season, families get together. Maybe you haven't been invited somewhere to eat yet. Or maybe, you know, you don't know if, if you're going to be alone this season. You, you want to be with somebody. Have we lost sight of this holy season? As believers, we should be seeking to see God's glory in everything, in everything around us. I mean, how great is it that our God is so great? We did this comparison. Socrates, I'm going to talk about philosophers now. Socrates he taught for 40 years. Plato for 50. Aristotle for 40. And Jesus only three years. Yet in his three years of ministry, he has impacted this world like no other. All these other philosophers, all these other people, just spoke for years and years and years. Three years, in the great scheme of things, three years is not a lot. But over 2,000 years later, he's still impacting my life. He's still impacting this church. And I know he's impacting your life. I see transformations going on in your lives. I see how you are different. I, there's so many of you that when I first met you, you have come a long way. I have come a long way. 
If, and if you guys were here when we first started out, I never spoke. Never. Pastor Georgina, your witness, um, you knew me. I, I hardly, I used to sing worship. And <laughs> actually, there's a funny story. I used to sing in your mother's church, Robert, um, when she was on, on OBT. And I have a little video clip of when I used to sing there. <laughs> and I used to be in the background. I didn't even lead, but I was like in the background. And I barely moved. I was very shy. I was very quiet. And I, was, I looked at that video. I was like, oh, my God. I can't believe I used to worship like that. I had like no emotions. I was so stiff. But then, you know, I started growing. I started maturing. I started feeling free in the Lord. I started lifting my hands. I started moving a bit. I made it to be a lead. I would get all involved in my worship, but just leave me in my worship. Don't, I don't want any more, anything else. But little by little, he's been working in me. The Holy Spirit has been active in our lives, and, and I am not the person I used to be. And now I could stand up here, and like my son-in-law, Matthew, tells me, Patora, you're starting to preach longer than pastor. I'm still holding that one against you. <laughs> but I can only say that that's what God does. I have seen his glory, and in this season, I am going to witness his glory, and I'm going to know and worship him during this season and in this season we as believers we welcome the grace of God we welcome the grace of God John finishes this great sentence by describing Jesus as the one the one who came from the father full of grace and truth there's one thing that every human being needs if they're ever going to truly be forgiven for their sin, if they're ever going to have a relationship with God, if they're ever going to understand the purpose for which they were here on earth. And it's the one thing that only God can give, and that is his grace. Even though grace is free, it is not cheap. We serve a God that is just, if you do the crime, you, you pay the time. Sin must be paid for. A just God must hold somebody responsible and accountable for the sins and the evil that all of us will commit. And to give us what we don't deserve, which is grace, God must take what we did not deserve, which is his mercy, so that our sins could be punished that is justice no angel could pull this off no mere human being could pull this off only the God man only God could pull this off you see if Jesus was not God then in the end really his life although noble would not have been necessary it would have just been a tragic life but it wouldn't have been a triumphant one. If just a man died on the cross 2,000 years ago, what good would it have done if he was just another man? But if Jesus is just a man, he didn't save us. He couldn't save anyone because no man as a man can be perfect and just and save sinners. It was the God man. It was God who died on that cross that day. It was the God man who came back from the grave three days later. It was the God man who sits on the throne of the universe. And it is the God man who is coming again. Jesus came as the son of God to the sons of men so that the son of men could become the sons of God. He didn't have to do it. We don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But yet he did. Nobody could make him do it. He did it willingly. He did it just 
because of his grace. Church, welcome his grace into your life this season. Let go of guilt. Let go of shame. Receive his forgiveness. Don't end this year the same way, battling with your cycles and your, and your cycles that you, you, you get over it for one minute, then you're right back. You get up again, then you're right back. Receive his grace and mercy. He has cleansed you. He has washed away your sin. The seed of sin is not in us. Oh, but the enemy does such a good job of keeping us there. Of keeping us with those strongholds where we think that he doesn't forgive us. Where we think that we don't deserve it. And we're, you're right, we don't deserve it. That's why, that's why it's so beautiful. That's why it's so special. Because we don't deserve it, but yet he's giving it to us. Welcome it into your life. Welcome it into your life. The season of Christmas, it's to celebrate God and all that he has done. The meaning of Christmas is simply divine. Christmas is simply divine. 